Who is going to be there for these communities? Who is going to be there for the Sydneys and the Austins that they represent tens of thousands? And so we really, that's where our story began is we finally looked at each other and said, we have to do something. We can do better. And we really thought that we were the two to take it and take charge as nurses. And so that's really where our story came. How can we bridge the gaps and avoid preventable medical errors for medically complex children living at home? Let's talk all about it with Tiffany Simon and Natalie McCauley, the co-developers of Project Austin at Children's Nebraska, right here on episode 490 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is about you, your personal and professional development, your career, and the healthcare system in the bigger picture. And I'm always here to share education, ideas, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. If you'd like to help other people find the show, my ubiquitous request is that you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or on Amazon or Spotify, and you become a patron over at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. As little as $2 a month is a great help in keeping things rolling over here at the Nurse Keith Show. You can also share the show with anyone who you think might enjoy it. And no matter how you're interacting with the show, I thank you so much for being here. Head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for the episode in the drop down menu labeled podcasts, or the show notes are also located in any app where you happen to be listening, be it Castro, Overcast, etc. And you can share the show from there with your loved ones, colleagues, and friends. As I said today, we are here today with Tiffany Simon and Natalie McCauley of Project Austin at Children's Nebraska. And Natalie and Tiffany, it's great to have you here. And there's a lot to talk about. We we checked in and had a conversation prior when you got in touch with me about Project Austin. So Tiffany, I want to throw the first question at, to you. And I want to ask you, what is it about medically complex children who are living at home that leads us to to know that we need to really pay special attention so that certain things don't fall between the cracks and we miss things between the hospital and home that are just crucial pieces of information that we just need to make sure we have dialed in. Yeah, so thanks for having us today. We're super honored to be here. So one of our focuses is definitely on children with medical complexity living at home. Um, In the past decade or so, the children with medical complexity has tripled. And that's because within the medical community, our research and innovation is not only able to allow these children to survive past when we typically would have thought they would have had a shorter lifespan, but they're able to thrive in their home. And with all of this advances in technology and innovation, when they these children are leaving the hospital and going to the home setting, their communities may not have the education, knowledge, and resources needed to care for them in a time of emergency. So there's definitely a gap in that continuity of care from the care team in a pediatric hospital to the care team in that patient's community. So things that may be um, standard care, standard protocols, such as your pediatric advanced life support or um, basic life support, That is good for about 99.9% of the population. But for some of these children with medical complexity, those standardizations of care may actually harm the child. And so it's really important to be able to provide that gap in care, gap in knowledge to those that would be called on to care for them in that time of emergency. I see. And then Tiffany, something happened in your life that was the impetus for founding Project Austin at Children's Nebraska. Do you mind sharing the story and just telling us a little bit so that we can contextualize how you and and then Natalie came to be involved in and form this organization and have this project be, you know, the project that it is now? Yeah. So my son, um, Austin, was born with a complex heart disease and a critical airway. We spent a large portion of his life in the hospital with numerous heart surgeries, and then ultimately we were discharged home, and Austin had a tracheostomy. 
we continue to have a critical airway, even with a tracheostomy in place. Um, and then, of course, um, one day, um, my husband and I, our worst nightmare came to life when um, when Austin's tracheostomy plugged. And we did what we were trained to do, but with his critical airway, it's it was not fixing the issue. His plug was below his trach, down into his carina area of his trache- trachea. And so we called 911. And um, as the general population, we think when we call 911, anybody that shows up is there to help. And um, when they showed up, the paramedics were just as much in a state of of uncertainty as Scott and I were as parents. They were not familiar with a child with medical complexity, how to care for his tracheostomy, and as well as his complex heart disease. And what ultimately happened was they were providing bag mask ventilation to his nose and mouth, which unfortunately for Austin was a medical error because um, he did not have an airway above his trachea. And so ultimately the results of that were um, Austin passing away from severe hypoxic brain injury. Now, I can't say for sure that that's what caused his death, but I know for certain that when I close my eyes at night, I can still see those paramedics, their look in their faces. Any of us that go into healthcare, go into healthcare because we want to help. We have a desire to help those in greatest need. And to be in a position where you don't know how to help, you don't have the resource, the education, the training to do the helping, that is just as detrimental to that healthcare professional as it is to the families and the patients that they're caring for. And so that was really the impetus of Project Austin is, yes, Project Austin is for that medically complex child, but it is just as much for those paramedics or those first responders, as well as the emergency department healthcare staffs that are caring for them. We have to do better as a pediatric institution and helping those that we are called on, um, that we're calling on to care for our patients when they're in the communities to provide that support for them so that they can feel accomplished, they can feel um, confidence in caring for these children. Well, Tiffany, first, of course, the first thing I need to say is I'm so sorry for what you experienced and for this loss. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no words for a parent who's lost a child. So um, I'm so sorry for your loss. And (laughs) the, the fact that you were able to take this loss and create something powerful and and useful to save others lives is amazing and you know a lot of people come out of tragedy and the tragedy for for good reason puts them in a place of inaction where they just you know they they just can't they just can't follow through on much of anything after such a such a loss and the fact that you were able to take your professional training and your position at children's and turn it into something positive from that is says so much about you and your husband and and how you've how you've approached this whole thing so i'm i'm so sorry and i'm i'm just amazed by what you've what you've done well thank you very much for that um but i would say i didn't do it alone my husband and i didn't do it alone we have mm-hmm. a lot of um family coworkers supporters and ultimately our um our faith has definitely given us that ability to turn our tragedy into action. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot. So, and and Natalie, where where do you come into the picture? Where Tiffany had this experience, and where do you fit into the the origins of this whole this whole concept and getting this project off the ground and creating creating what you all have created to this day? Yeah, so Tiffany and I's journey together, as I said, really started um, over 19 years ago. So we met, we were both pediatric um, intensive care unit nurses. And so I was a brand new grad and Tiffany had been there a couple of years. And so, you know, Austin's story, as you just heard Tiffany tell it, the way she says it so eloquently, um, a lot of people didn't even know that story of hers and Austin's and that heartbreak and her entering the field and becoming a nurse with that as a background. And so we met during that time. Um, I actually grew up in a very tiny town in a rural area. Um, I always say to people, I was like, we did not have a stoplight. We did not have a McDonald's. Um, I graduated with 26 people. And so before I was even a nurse, my dad was a 
volunteer EMT. So he was one of those that potentially could have been called to a call like Austin. And I remember my dad was my hero and he always had his radio. And anytime that there was a call and that would go off, he would rush to help. It didn't matter where we were at, what we were doing. He had that heart and that willingness, just that servant ability that he wanted to help. And so I remember thinking of that and that bravery, but I also now into my adulthood when I entered the career of nursing, also remembered those pediatric calls. And I remember him coming home and sometimes that, that kind of that heartbreak and all of that not understanding the depth of that until I myself became a pediatric nurse and really realized that he did not have that training. He did not have the resources to be able to take care of a pediatric patient in general, let alone a medically complex. So it was such a low volume, high risk type of patient. As I got into a couple years of my career working alongside Tiffany, I also had my niece was six years old and she was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And she lived a couple hours away from Children's Nebraska as well, but obtained her care here. And so over the course of her battle with cancer, what I saw was a child who um, her innocence really got ripped away. And so instead of school programs and vacation Bible schools and things of that sort, she all of a sudden was pulled into 911 calls, helicopter rides, ambulance, you know, visits, ED visits, surgeries on repeat. And so when she finally lost her battle to cancer and we went back and looked, um, found that she had spent close to two and a half years of her short, tiny life in the... Mm -hmm four walls of the hospital. Hmm. And the community, again, much like my dad, wanted to serve and help, but they didn't know how to help her. And so Tiffany and I working alongside each other in our journeys and our career, having these personal and professional sides of this, seeing our patients that we took care of, it truly was one of those, you know, life happens and and people come into your life for a reason. And I truly feel like that was that for Tiffany and I. And we really looked at each other and had to say this, you know, if not us, then who? Who is going to be there for these communities? Who is going to be there for the Sydneys and the Austins that they represent tens of thousands? And so we really, that's where our story began is we finally looked at each other and said, we have to do something. We can do better. And we really thought that we were the two to take it and take charge as nurses. And so that's really where our story came. Wow. So Tiffany, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, having an amazing dynamic partner like Natalie is, is a big part of the, the, is probably half the battle of making something like this happen, right? Absolutely. Um, I would say that, you know, Natalie has been the best partner through all of this. And one of the things that is so unique about our relationship is we, you know, we started off in the pediatric intensive care unit as nurses, and we have grown and expanded through our profession together, but also in our own paths. Um, but we're both very different people. If you look at our Gallup strengths, we have very different strengths. And, um, but that has been very um, beneficial to both of our relationship and the ability to grow um, Project Austin into what it is because we both accept e each other's strengths and we both recognize and accept each other's weaknesses. Um, but we use those to make each other better and um, to support each other. Yeah. And so definitely this couldn't have been done without without the partnership between the two of us. I'm sure. And and then the the coordination and cooperation of Children's Nebraska because you run the project out of Children's has been phenomenal. So Children's Nebraska when we first brought this idea to them were like, yeah, this sounds great. You know, it sounds absolutely like like this is the right thing to do, do it. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. at the time anybody knew how big it was going to get, um, but Children's Nebraska has been behind our backs the entire time, the entire way, um, not only um, from an executive level with the financial support, but also from a professional um, standpoint. Right. So I understand the Project Austin started with 15 patients back in 2015, and today you serve more than 2,000 of the area's most medically vulnerable children across an eight state region. So for those listening, 
who might be nurses in this particular part of the world. What are the eight states where Project Austin has a footprint? Being a regional medical center, um, Children's Nebraska serves patients from all over the Midwest. And so we have Project Austin patients that use Children's Nebraska as our medical home, and they are spread across um, the following states, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Kansas, Missouri, and Texas. Okay. So a lot of people listening will probably will hear the states where they live. and. Mm-hmm. You have partnerships with 700 EMS departments in the Midwest. So, Natalie, can you tell me what those partnerships look like? Like, are you all are you all physically like going out and educating each of these EMS departments? I mean, there's 700 of them. So how does the education and the coordination happen? Because there's two of you in this small project and all of these organizations and EMS departments across so many states. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Tiffany and I, when we transitioned with our career, we both, while we were developing Project Austin and just starting out on this journey, we were both in outreach roles. And Tiffany at that time had transitioned to a trauma outreach coordinator and I was the transport outreach coordinator. So we had started developing relationships with a lot of these communities. Where Children's Nebraska sits, we really are the regional pediatric center. And so all of those states where we have patients, um, that's where we draw those. It's all those patients have to come here for that actual specialized care due to their medical complexities. And so with these communities, what we do is we directly work with them within their resources and training available. And so once we know that a child with medical complexity is being discharged to their home community, we do a lot of work we have within that community to first see what are the resources, um, what type when that family calls 911, who's going to be showing up at the door. And then within that, you're exactly right. We have put a lot of miles on our car. We have eaten a lot of road trip food because we do go out there. And the reason we do that is for us, it was very important. And again, taking that rural background that I had is teaching people in a rural community how to take care of a child with medical complexity at Children's Nebraska, a pediatric specialty center is not useful. But going out there and looking and saying, these are the resources that you have available, defining those roles. And really, that's where we've extended that definition of that healthcare team to include them. That's what we do. So we do a full emergency planning. And that goes from the 911 dispatch to what everybody's roles are, to what equipment that they will need, all the way into what our things at the hospital, at a local community hospital, those kind of lower acuity needs that can be taken care of, or when do they need to transfer? And we just clean all of that communication up. And so definitely a lot of road work, um, but I would say one of the most important part of that was establishing that trust and that relationship and giving them usable information. And, you know, we hear right now health literacy is a huge topic. It's a huge topic for our parents in pediatric medicine that we hear. Tiffany and I with Project Austin took that a step further and really looked at the health literacy of our community members, of our EMS and EDs that are not specialty pediatric trained, and also looking at how they care for these, taking into account, you know, that assess and intervene type of model rather than trying to make them experts on the child. I see. Wow. Okay. So when we come back from the break, I want to talk about some of the numbers because you all have crunched the numbers over these years to show what Project Austin has really accomplished. And I want to talk about, although you are you are present in these eight states, I want to talk a little bit about what can happen and what can others do in other regions of the country where these same issues are run into and what your vision of what that might look like if other organizations and other people could take the reins of this in other parts of the U.S. So there's a lot more to talk about. So please hang in there with us. This is 
episode 490 of the Nurse Keith Show with Tiffany Simon and Natalie McCauley of Project Austin at Children's Nebraska. And we'll be right back for the second half of the episode. Hey, everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? If you're in need of personalized holistic career coaching to elevate your nursing and healthcare career, look no further than NurseKeith.com and NurseKeith Coaching. I can help you with your job search and interview strategies, resume and cover letter optimization, LinkedIn maximization, and envisioning the future of your career. I can also support you in launching your own business, learning how to write and blog as a side hustle, or launch your own podcast. And please note that you can receive 10% off your first coaching package if you mention the show. So email me at keith at nursekeith.com to schedule a complimentary 30-minute strategy session. Now, let's get back to the episode at hand. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friends of the pod and my new friends and colleagues, Tiffany Simon and Natalie McCauley of Project Austin at Children's Nebraska. And Tiffany and Natalie, before the break, we were talking about the genesis of Project Austin, how Children's Nebraska has embraced this project since you brought it to them. And you're now working with 700 EMS departments across the eight states that you enumerated for for us. And and Natalie, I wanted to ask you about some of the some of the data that you all have crunched, the numbers you've crunched in terms of what's happened since the inception of Project Austin. And what I understand is there's been a 27% reduction in hospital admissions for these medically complex children. There's been a 23% reduction in ED visits and a 50% decrease overall in terms of hospital lengths of stay and 55% financial cost reduction across all services, not just ED. So, you know, when, when you look at those numbers, Natalie, and you talk to the EMS departments and you talk to whoever it is that you interact with, how do people respond to the fact that this project has had such a, gosh, I mean, such a massive impact on quality of care and obviously cost of care. You know, I think people are really shocked and it was an interesting model that we did in general. And when we talk about, you know, earlier in the show about the support we had from Children's Nebraska as an organization, um, for our patients, we don't charge for this program. And so this data not only was very validating for the fact that we had a program and this journey that we've done is really paid off, um, but I think for the people that we work with, what it really does for them is it empowers them to feel like they're making a difference. So a lot of these EMS people, when we talk about those feelings of helplessness, that's what we would hear is that I want to help. I don't know how to help. and so. You know, it's really kind of a simple model is what we said is we knew that for these medically complex children, as we said, um, because these EMS and hospitals are so protocol driven, we had to really concentrate and individualize those plans to avoid medical errors. Um, We also had to do that role differentiation to empower them to feel like they were a part of a part of that team and could help. And so when they see numbers that they're impacting and able to keep these children at home where they belong, instead of just shipping them off to Children's Nebraska, I think that's the big thing that I see is people are shocked. And then, of course, with that financial decrease, um, that was huge. That was a huge part. And most of these kids by nature, because of they, you know, they are users of the system and they have to be because of their medical complexities. And so a large part of them are Medicaid. And so at a time right now with the healthcare swing, where we really have to look at a pair mix and how were that sustainability model, that was that huge component to know that by just giving that simple concept, right information to the right people at the right time translates to the right care. And then of course, the utmost thing is, wow, look at this, a 55% cost reduction 
which was close to $221 million that we were able to help through the resources of Project Austin over a five-year time span. So I think those are the biggest words that come, shocked, empowered, um, and very validating to see this data. Yeah, that's amazing. And and Natalie, I know you're the Project Austin Program Manager of External Affairs and obviously a co-developer of the of the program itself. And you mentioned earlier that both you and Tiffany were PICU nurses. So that's part of your history. And I know you've been in pediatric neonatal critical care transport. You've been an ECMO specialist. Um, you were a transport outreach coordinator. And so there's so much that you've done. But I'm curious for you, Natalie, like running a project like this, did, do you feel like everything you've done in your career up until Project Austin prepared you for this? Or has it been a steep learning curve in terms of running something like this? Has, has there been just things you've needed to learn that you didn't learn in nursing school and you didn't learn as an ECMO specialist or a PICU nurse? I absolutely think all every single piece of my journey, my career here at Children's Nebraska has prepared me for this. Early on in my career, I had a really good mentor that told me, Natalie, when you're entering medicine, you never ever want to run away from a job. Don't get yourself burnt out. You need to run towards an opportunity. And every job that I've done, I've loved. I loved being a PICU nurse. I loved working on transport. And it really just kind of, I think, shaped me. As I said, people and places and opportunities, I really just ran towards those. And I truly feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. And this is where my passion is. I think the deepest learning curve is as nurses, we lead with our hearts. And that really is. I We call Project Austin our passion project. It truly is. There's so much passion and heart behind it. And for us, for it to be sustainable, the biggest part was learning that healthcare is a large business and that we have to be very research and data driven. So that data and being able to tell the story and the and all of that, that was my biggest learning curve was the business side. But the part of what I'm doing my day to day, I feel like, yeah, it just was kind of a natural progression of my career. And it really truly is where I should be right now. Mm, yeah. And Tiffany, how about for you? Is it like for Natalie that you feel like everything you've done in PICU and medical and cardiac intensive care and critical care transport and ECMO. And I know you were also a trauma outreach coordinator. So do you feel like everything prepared you for this or were there things that you feel like you had to just kind of learn by the seat of your pants doing something like Project Austin? Well, all the above. So nursing schools are phenomenal and they create a cornerstone for what nursing is all about. But you don't really learn, quote unquote, learn nursing until you're actually in the field doing the work. And the beautiful thing about nursing is that you're always learning. As soon as you feel like you know it all, it's time to move on to the next thing because there's no opportunity that you're going to ever be in where you're going to know it all. So absolutely, um, every single part of my journey has given me has built on that cornerstone to get me to where I am right now with with Project Austin. And I'll be honest, I never, ever thought that I would be in the healthcare field. Um, I originally wanted, I was debating whether or not to go to law school or um, do accounting. And that's when I had Austin. And after Austin passed, I decided I was going to be a nurse. Um, so I would say we sometimes we have a vision and a dream, but sometimes God is like, that's not my vision and dream for you. And you get put into areas um, and it's just been a natural flow throughout my journey from being an ICU nurse to a critical care transport team to ECMO to trauma outreach has all built this built upon that cornerstone to bring me to where I am with Project Austin. And I'm continuously learning. And it has been such an exciting, fun journey, although scary at times. And if anybody's ever looking at what can I do with my nursing career and what's the next step, mm -hmm. the biggest thing to remember is don't be afraid of change and don't be afraid of what you don't know. Because in healthcare, we have so many people around us that are so um, have such 
unique experiences and expertise in different areas. So I might not be very business minded, but I have a lot of people within me or excuse me, within the organization that I can lean on to help build through that, to help strengthen that part of where I'm weaker at. That's great. I mean, we do have to lean on other people because we can't do everything and we can't know everything, but we do as nurses, we do learn how to multitask. We learn how to, to take on, you know, kind of, I guess you can call it just in time learning. Like I'm sure there's Mm -hmm. stuff where you've just needed to learn it in the moment because you had to learn it to move some part of the project forward. And you and Mm -hmm. Natalie probably have put your heads together on many different pieces of this and just made it happen. But I have a question for you. So something I didn't get when I read your bio and I talked to you earlier and then in this conversation that when this happened with Austin, you weren't a nurse at the time? I was not. I was um I was a young adult, just married, just had um Austin and um I had to leave the job that I was in to be Austin's caretaker and mother. And um, when he passed, it was obviously very heartbreaking. And um, to be honest, my husband and I, um, we packed up and moved to Colorado for a very short period of time because um, just even going to the grocery store, we had a clerk that always checked us out at the grocery store and she had said, where's Austin? Mm-hmm. And that at that point was when I was like, I can't, I can't stay here. I can't do this anymore. So we left and went to Colorado for a couple of months just to get through our grieving process. And, um, and I just woke up one morning and I was like, okay, this is what I got to do. I got it. I, I have to go to nursing school. So moved back to Omaha and went to nursing school. And, um, my very first job was actually in the pediatric intensive care unit that Austin spent a good portion of his life. Wow. I'm sure there's some nurses out there who can relate and I'm sure there's others who are just shaking their heads like, oh my gosh, if that had happened to me, I never could have done what, what Tiffany did. So that's, that's incredible. And the fact that you wanted to take that and apply your tragedy in such a way. And, and then I'm sure at the time when you went to nursing school, I'm sure there was no notion in your mind about running a project like this and working with hundreds of people across multiple states. I mean, you just wanted to go to nursing school and and help help other people in similar circumstances, I'm sure, right? Absolutely. That's what I thought is that I would go into the pediatric intensive care unit and my first um thought was I'm gonna ret- I'm gonna start and I'm gonna retire here. And mm-hmm. um at that Point, I was just thinking what I wanted to do was just provide that um, extra support to parents um, to be like, hey, I've actually been in your situation before and I know what you're thinking and I know what you're feeling and look and lean on me like like somebody in healthcare. Like, very do we have somebody in healthcare when we're receiving healthcare? We have somebody that's on the other side that understands what I might be feeling about as being a caregiver or a parent. And I wanted to give that opportunity to other families to be like, I do understand. And it's okay to feel how you're feeling and it's okay to be mad and it's okay to be frustrated. Um, I I can be here for you in that extra layer of support. And so that's what I thought I would always do for the rest of my career. And um, like I said before, God just has other plans and just move me me along through my journey. That's that's really beautiful. And I'm sure there's there's plenty of parents out there and children too who have benefited greatly from your wisdom and from your experience and your you know your dedication to to this to the goals of the project and Natalie um we have to wind down but I wanted to ask you a question so last year Project Austin won the American Nurses Credentialing Center the ANCC Magnet Prize and that's allowing Project Austin to work with children's hospitals across the country to set up Project Austin services in their communities. And that's something that I've been thinking about since I first heard from from you all about being on the show. I was like, wow, how could this be replicated? So what does the ANCC Magna Prize mean to you all? And what is it allowing you to do? And what do you see as the the kind of the next, the next iteration? 
Absolutely. You know, the ANCC Magnet Prize really just gave us a platform to do our next, is what I like to call it. So Tiffany and I, when we developed this project, it was never our intent or our our end goal to service the medically complex children's and communities within the children's Nebraska area. We knew that this should be far bigger. And so that has always been our plan. And, and we would get that question is, when will you guys retire? When will you feel good? And we said, I don't know what that point is, but this is a problem. And we found a solution to a nationwide and beyond, even an international problem. And so with that Magnet Award, Press Ganey um, offered a generous donation. That's part of that award. And what we wanted to do with that money is to do exactly what you would ask. How can you replicate this? And so we've been working really hard over the past year to launch our national collaborative. And so the idea and the concept behind that is children's hospitals across the nation will be able to join the national collaborative and then they can be that service area expert, that resource for the children that they served within their respective pediatric centers. And so um, with that, we are offering everybody, this has been a 10-year journey for us. And we don't want somebody to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we don't want this to be a siloed project. We really want others to join this. We have an entire playbook, which gives them everything that they need to know how to run the program. Tiffany and I plan to actually do consultatives to go out there and help them launch this as well, um, as well as everything we use from the platform of our emergency medical plan to outreach, training modules, all of that that we've done over the past 10 years, we want to share so we can have Project Austin programs ac across the nation. And so that really is our, our big end goal um, as well to be able to benchmark with other children's organizations and make this very research driven as well. So um, we're not done at all. I'll be like, it's been 10 years right now, but it we truly have no destination. We really do not. Um, we want to continue to think bigger. We want to continue to um, extend our arms and really reach all the medically complex children in these communities who serve them. And that truly is kind of our next. Wow. And will it be called Project Austin as it expands around the country? Or is it something you hand off to other regions or states and then they kind of create their own organization? It will be Project Austin. Project Austin. So joining, okay. yeah. So joining the collaborative, they will be a Project Austin designated facility. And um, with that, we have trademarked our, and copyrighted our materials that they'll have access then to the Project Austin materials and name and everything that goes with it. Um, we are also working on a national database that's being built. So that data that you talked about, we want to see that impact on a national level. So we'll be able to actually hub that all into one central location and again, benchmark and really learn from each other and just continuing to improve the quality of care for these medically complex children. That's beautiful. So gosh, there's so much more we could talk about, but we do have to, to wind down now. And I... I have four questions I ask of all my guests, and they're not really related to what we've been talking about. It's just more personal questions for both of you. And since there's two of you, we'll have to make the answers kind of concise because um, you're each going to answer all four. And each of you is going to get to hear the other answer two of the questions first. So you'll be able to think in the back of your mind. You won't be quite as on the spot. So. Tiffany, I'm going to start with you. And the first question, and Natalie can cheat by listening to what you have to say. Um, but Tiffany, how do you define success? What does success mean to you? Oh, boy. Well, I think, first of all, when you talk about success, you have to know what your bullseye is. What is your goal to start with? And what is your why to get there? And if you're able to wake up every morning and then lay your head on your pillow every night thinking what I did today um, got me closer to that bullseye and my why hasn't changed. I, um, or even if it does need to change, it changes. But um, 
you know that you lived every day to your fullest potential to to hit your bullseye and you know your why and you stand firmly on that that to me would be success that's awesome and how about how about you natalie what what does it mean to you you know it's it's interesting listening to tiffany's because i could probably echo a lot but i truly feel like success for me at the end of the day is living out your purpose what is your purpose and as i said mine has changed but when we really talk about um as tiffany said that bullseye what is that purpose where are you going and adapting to be there um and feeling like you did the best job that you could that day we all have good days bad days but the end of the time success to me and as i've grown um in my career and just as a person i've learned that did i give the best that i could give that day and that truly to me is success that's great thank you and natalie i'll throw question two at you first um is there a person who you could name living or dead famous or doesn't have to be a famous person could be from your personal life who you feel like has really inspired you in the course of your life like a person who's just one of those touchstones for you that would be my dad mm -hmm. um you know my dad was just always my hero he never diverted from that why and he was just somebody that was so embracing to to everybody um what i grew up with him was an accepting person that always looked to see how he could be a light to others and um I, that's always resonated with me and i see my dad in a lot of what i do and i really strive to be with him you know to be a lot like him um you know Growing up, like I said, in this tiny community, I have to tell you, when my dad passed away and we went there, um, they closed the entire community down and more people came um, to his services than people that lived in my home community. And that to me showed that it was an impact from people of all walks of life all over the world and they all came in. And so he truly is someone that always comes to light and definitely is my hero and definitely always behind um, my drive to continue. Thank you. Thanks you for that. And um, Tiffany, how about you? Is there someone who you would like to mention? I would have to say it would be my husband, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, we've been together for several decades. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he's just always been um, my rock. He knows me, he gets me. Um, and he's also just probably one of the most generous, caring people that I know. And um, anytime I'm having a bad day or just a bad time, he's there to support me and um, and to get me through and me to see the tunnel. So I would definitely say he's he's my biggest cheerleader and my biggest support. That's awesome. That's great. And Tiffany, the third question I'll throw to you: Is there a book, a movie? anything out there in the culture that is one of those places that you go back to like something that is just a touchstone or a place that's just just holds a really special a special place in your heart and is something you can continually go back to and lean on um I would say the thing that I always go back to and always lean on would be the Bible mm -hmm. or the scriptures. Um, I, I tend to lean on that on a, you know, on a daily basis. I um, study the Torah through and through every week. Um, but I would say Psalm 23 is probably one of my biggest, when I need, um, when I need the biggest comfort is what I would fall back on. Many people bring up the Bible, and I think for good reason. So thank you for sharing that. And um, Natalie, how about you? Is there something that you lean on that you keep going back to? Yes, I would echo definitely my faith and and the Bible. It's got me through the hard times, the good times, um, something that I always go back to, um, and it has never failed me. So I would definitely say that's where that's where I would go. That's lovely. Okay. I'm sure a lot, a lot, a lot of people can relate to that. Okay. And Natalie, last question. If you were named queen of the world tomorrow, 
and you had ultimate power, you could do everything you ever wanted to do, what would be the first thing you would want to do to improve the lives of your subjects? Bearing in mind, you could eventually do it all, but like your first act as queen, what would you do? Wow, that is a that is a tough question and a lot of power. A it tough is. question and a lot of power. But I, the very first thing that I would do, um, create a a huge Disneyland, a safe place for them. You know, the thing that I've learned about medically complex is they become a diagnosis. They become what the medical team has told them that they are, and it dehumanizes them. And I wish the world could just see them for the humans they were. That is the part that I love with this. These are kids. These are people. They are playing and laughing and loving cartoons and just bring so much joy to this world and impact this world. And so I think it would create a platform um, where they could be just that, just be who they are, humans, not their diagnosis. That's beautiful. That's awesome. How about you, Tiffany? What would you do as queen, your first act out of the out of the box, so to speak? Um, so as queen, um, I became queen of the medically complex children. I would um, definitely make things more equitable and um, take what we know about healthcare and make it equal. Um, there's so many children out there that need the care, um, but their families are having difficulty just putting food on the table or a roof over their head. And so how can we make things more equitable um, so that everybody has that same, that same cornerstone, that same base of a starting point in their lives um, just to be able to, you know, healthcare is so important, but when we are struggling just with food and shelter, it's hard to even start talking about, you know, a DEXA scan or uh, a CT scan to follow up on, a, on a, um, the progression of a neurological disease. Um, so I would definitely probably start with that. Well said. Those are both great places to begin. And Natalie McCauley and Tiffany Simon, thank you so much. We're going to encourage people to go to projectaustin.com where they can learn more about the project and keep in touch with you all. We'll have links to that. We'll have links to your LinkedIn profile so people can get in touch with you directly and let, let you know they heard you on the show. Thank you so much for all the great work you do in the world. Congratulations on the ANCC Magnet um, Award. And I hope that we see their replication of Project Austin all around the country in the next few years. And I can't wait to hear more about what happens and maybe we can revisit this conversation in a few years. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Yep. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember the show notes are at nursekeith.com or in the app where you're listening. Please go to projectaustin.com to learn all about the project. You'll find links to Natalie and Tiffany's LinkedIn profiles. If you'd like to get in touch with them directly and say hi, please let them know that you heard them here on the Nurse Keith Show. And remember, go to projectaustin.com. If you need personalized holistic career coaching, please look no further than Nurse Keith Coaching and NurseKeith.com. Mention the show and get 10% off your first coaching package. And if you want to become a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith. I appreciate you all so much. We are proud members of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. And we are adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting. And before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by Maya Angelou. She said, you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. Please remember that your difficulties do not define you. They simply strengthen your ability to overcome. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Tiffany Simon saying goodbye from... Omaha, Nebraska. And Natalie McCauley saying arrivederci from... Omaha, Nebraska. All right. Natalie and Tiffany, thank you so much. Thanks to Project Austin and to Children's Nebraska. And we will catch you, of course, on the proverbial flip side.